Point of View is sponsored by First National Bank. First National Bank, how can we help you? The Point of View is brought to you by Cowbell Coffee. Cowbell Coffee. Taste it. Love it. Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television. Here on The Point of View, we get the right guests, ask them, uh, important questions on issues that matter to you. Today is May Day, it's a holiday, and we have a big guest. We'll be talking economy, we'll be speaking wages, we'll be speaking development and sports with my guest. But don't forget, the point of view is brought to you by First National Bank, How Can We Help You, and Cowbell Coffee. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Point of View. So my guest is a big man, big, big, big man. Let me just mention about nine different things about him before I, I show him to you. So he was the chairman of the bid committee for CAN 2008 hosting rights for the Africa Cup of Nations in 2008. You remember that tournament? Tournament in which we were uh, third, I think. That was the Michaelisian Sulemuntari tournament. He was made chairman of the 2008 CAF football tournament, so he chaired that particular event, hosted in the stadiums, where we built two stadiums, you remember the Esipon Stadium in uh, Takrade, and also the Tamale Stadium and the refurbishment of Ohinejan and Kumasi Babayara as well. He was also a member of President Kufo's Advisory Council, established to grow the economy and attract investment, an advisor to Dr. Baumia at some point as well, appointed a member of the Normalization Committee, a lot of sports people are interested in that. Appointed ambassador at large uh, during the Akufuado era. And then up outside of all of that, he's known as the man who brought Western Union to Africa. And we know that that's become a very important part of the African economy. The issue of remittances, which incidentally Sam Jonas spoke about, whether we can keep depending on remittances in the form in which they are coming because a lot of the people abroad don't feel as connected to the continent as they did in the past. So through Western Unions and other similar companies, hundreds of billions of dollars have been pumped into this continent, and he's seen as one of the people who champion that. And these days, he also lectures and advises students at KNUST and UDS on development and entrepreneurship and strategy. He also launched something called the Movement for Progress in November 2020, We'll find out whether it's political party or just something else is doing. And of course, today being World Labor Day, I want to talk to Dr. Kofi Amad. Doc, great to have you. Good evening. Thank you, Bernard. You're looking good. It's good to see you. I'm copying you. How are you, sir? I'm, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. You go quiet and then you come out again. It's almost like you time when you speak. I think the last major time I heard of you was before the elections when you launched the Movement for Progress. Yes. Apart from that, I haven't heard you much except on one or two media platforms. Is it deliberate? No, I think uh, you speak when there's an issue that mm. you have passion and you have something to say. Mm. You know? I mean, otherwise you become like a parrot. And um, at some point, people tune out. Because some people but, say um, when people's mm. mouths are full, they keep quiet. So they assume that when somebody's making a lot of money, they don't talk much. Is, is that right? That's what some people say. It, this is not the case. <laughs> <laughs> but So what have you been up to? Because I know you're a businessman, you do a lot of things, but the last public job you did was serving on the Normalization Committee. Correct. Apart from that, what else do you do? I'm a developer. Right now I'm doing a five-star hotel, um, a 25-acre beachfront property in Kokrobite. Okay. Um, I also do commercial buildings, 
And my business in the United States is still active, so I keep in touch with that. And so you are still part of the system that brought Western Union to Africa? No, no. I, no. I, 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 I work with them for about 15 years, but no longer uh, involved. Okay. Yeah. But you are a developer? Yes. Which means you, you, you understand the real estate market in Ghana quite well. The, that is my main forte, yes. Some people say our, our real estate market or our housing market in general is a bubble waiting to burst because they think there's too much um, hot money coming in. There's the, the properties are at the high end mm -hmm. and you don't have enough property for the middle class. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, I mean, the prices at which people are selling stuff in Accra for millions of dollars, mm -hmm. even in New York, you wouldn't get that. So they feel it's, 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 it's not sustainable. What are your quick thoughts on our real estate sector? Well, it will not be sustainable if there's no more supply. Mm. If the demand stays high and the supply stays where it is, then the prices will maintain their, their values. But if, for some reason, the market opens up and mm. more developers come in and start constructing more properties, then supply and demand forces will come in and it will come down. Mm. But see, the, the Ghana real estate market is sectorial. You have the very high end, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. But the middle and the bottom... Um, at the bottom end, you don't even have any products because there's no affordability. And this is why there's a shortage of housing crisis in Ghana. And so why, why do people prefer to build for the high end? As you rightly said, mm -hmm. look at Saglemi, it's there. Mm -hmm. We don't have real housing for the poor. Mm -hmm. Middle class people struggle to also get good housing, even though there is some. Mm -hmm. But go to Cantonments, go to Ridge, mm -hmm. you see high end properties. Mm -hmm. what, what drives that? Affordability. Affordability? The, the market at that end, you have enough people who can afford. But are they Ghanaians or they are, who are, is it foreigners? Some people think there's a lot of illicit money from the sub-region coming to invest in real estate in Ghana. That's what some people think. Well, I don't in terms know. of buying, yes. which is why the demand is high. I don't have any proof of that. But what I know is that when you build a high end, you're able to sell them. People will buy, people buy cash. Yes, they buy cash because we don't have mortgage financing. A few of the banks are trying to provide loans for housing, but most sales in the real estate market are cash. Mm. So it has to be people who have cash. But when somebody is buying cash, they are looking at the future earnings. You know, so long as there's escalation, so long as you have inflation mm. in the in the in the materials that you use for construction, mm. the price of cement is going up, the price of iron rods is going up. So whatever you build today five years from now, because of the escalation of the inputs that went into it, the value will be higher. What is the state of our economy? Today is May Day. What, what do you think? Where is our economy, in your view? Well, before I get to that, let me um, say hello to Ghanaian workers, the labor. No country can advance uh, ahead without workers. And let me also say that uh, workers' incentives are very, very critical. And the main incentive for workers to create productivity is their wages. Mm. And I think that in general, we've been talking about this forever, in general, the wages and salary levels in Ghana are very low. And we need to look at that. Because if somebody is going to go to work eight hours a day, you know, um, for the whole month, and at the end of the month, what he's going to get is not adequate to take care of himself and his family then the incentive system that is supposed to make him interested in working and producing more d diminishes. And, and until we do that, we we'll begin to see Ghanaian workers not fully focused in what they're doing. They're trying their best, but I think the salaries are very low and we need to look at it. But which comes first, productivity or salaries? Because there's an argument that factor productivity of labor, if you compare us to certain countries, is also very low. So where do we start this, fixing this thing from? I think I had this discussion with you on the radio side a long time ago. When somebody's head is below the water, he cannot breathe. Mm. And you are telling him, I need productivity from you. Mm. It is not practical. So I think in the situation in Ghana, the wages must come to pull the people's productivity high. Because sometimes when you look at people's salaries, you calculate even their transportation how they come to work, how they go home. They will eat lunch, then they go dinner. It doesn't compute. Mm -hmm. So we have to be realistic. The salary levels in Ghana are below the living wage, and we need to do something to bring it up. 
Mm. So, so workers can have some, some room to breathe and make them work more to produce things for the country. The president announced on May Day the first that uh, he had put a freeze on salary increases for himself and his appointees this year. This includes the vice president, mm -hmm. the ministers of state, and other appointees of the executive. Now, according to the information, the president says this is a way to appreciate the plight of Ghanaians in the wake of the negative impact of COVID-19. What do you think about this? Is this far reaching enough? Is this a good example? Well, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good show of concern mm. for the plight of workers. But does that solve the problem? The, the problem of workers not being paid adequately. So that's a much bigger issue. And as I just said, without the productivity of Ghanaian workers, the Ghanaian economy is not going to grow, it's not going to be expansive, it's not going to produce the wealth that we need to move forward. Mm -hmm. So the salaries and wages structure debate, discussion, I think, is something that must be embraced by the executive, by parliament. Eh? I mean, we are, we are practicing liberal economics, so you don't have price controls here. But all the same, uh, something that is very fundamental to an, uh, the economy of a society, you don't just uh, talk about it and leave it. You know, there's a lot of the corruption that is going on. There are some people, regardless of how much you pay them, corruption will be there. Mm. But there are some people who are born honest and they will do what they have to do. Mm -hmm. But if you put them in a situation where uh, it becomes tempting, I'm not saying because of that they should do it, but it, it becomes tempting and they do that. So I think that big issue facing the nation is salaries and wages. So the, the government, but again, I'm thinking, where do they get the money, though? Because this is the same government that is criticized for borrowing. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the basic economics, consumption, investment, government expenditure, plus net exports is national income, right? Mm -hmm. So if people spend money, we get taxes from some of that, or government spends money to do roads and things, mm -hmm. or people bring money from abroad to invest, mm -hmm. then our net imports over, exports over imports, that's essentially our money. Everything else is borrowed. So if you're saying the government should pay people better, where should they get the money from? Or where would they get the money from? Well, Brian, it's, it's here, here, here is not just government. Private sector people, banks, insurance companies okay. must also look at the salaries of their people. Okay. okay. TV stations, cities, you know. And everybody. All we're everybody. all part. Yeah, we're all part of it. Not, everybody in Ghana doesn't work for government. Mm -hmm. So it's a general problem that scales through the economy and the society. Now, on the government side, let me look at it this way. Mm -hmm. You have the, the public sector wages, mm -hmm. which is breaking the back of government's expenditure, the SSSS. You are aware of that's about eight billion. I think it's higher now. Now, if you're going to pay eight billion Ghana cities for one sector of the economy, then the 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 productivity, mm -hmm. the, what you're getting from it, must become very important. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you look at it, a lot of times is bloated. Employment. I think when Sir Tekpe was at the Minister of Finance, he said he needed something like 50 to 80 people. He had 400. So we have a situation where we have we have overhired, and the budget the budget of a ministry is spread so thin mm. to more people instead of hiring the, the exact number of people that you need and deepening their salary, their wages, and paying them well so they can be more productive. So the, the reform process that was started under Kufo, we really didn't finish it. Mm. We have to take a look at it. And here is what I talk, I, I keep saying that parliament is being given the supervisory responsibilities by the constitution. So if there's a ministry that is, that is over bloated mm. uh, uh, payroll, call the minister, Mr. Minister, how many people do you really need? Okay. That's what I'm saying. So if we interrogate deeper and deeper and deeper, we we'll begin to structure and streamline mm. the public sector wages and get it down and pay the rest of the people who are left much better. Mm. Now, you, your follow-up question is going to be, what are you going to do with the people that you get rid of? And that is always an issue. Mm. And, and that, that issue cascades into the general lack of jobs in the country. Because of, there's a general lack of jobs, a lot of people have been pushed into places doing nothing. 
they go to work, they, they, are not, they, they don't feel actualized. But why is there lack of work? I always think about it. So you have a lot of land. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of people. Ghana has 30 million people. Probably a, a, a good percentage are pro, uh, in pro, of productive age. You have vast amounts of land. You have rivers. Mm -hmm. so, so why is it, So when the economy says they don't have work, <laughs> And this is very typical to African countries. Mm -hmm. Why don't they have work? Well, if, if, if that's the discussion you want to have, and which is the most important discussion that this country must have, and Africa must have, why are your people jobless? Yeah. Then you go back and you look at the economic history mm. of all these nations okay. who used to be like us. America was, didn't start the way they are today. Mm. The UK, France, Belgium, Germany, they didn't start the way they are today. They all started like us. So common sense tells me, what did these people do to create jobs? To create a viral domestic economy, which then cascaded, cascaded to get to this point. And I think, give me a chance to talk about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. You put your hands on it. The biggest resource our nation Ghana has are two things people and land. And these resources, these two resources, mm -hmm. people and land, are also the same resources that America used, the UK used, mm -hmm. Germany used, and I call them the first wave of countries to develop. And the second wave of countries that came, China, Japan, Korea, they also used the same two resources. So people and land. Then, the third wave of countries, who came? Malaysia. Malaysia, Singapore, this and that. They also use the same. People and land. And when we came, the classmates of Ghana, Ghana came, we started the same way. Kwame Nkrumah started, Kwame Nkrumah's development plan was heavy on agriculture. Mm. Look at the Cocoa Project. Mm. Ghana had not seen this crop before when Tete Kwashi brought it. With intelligent government policy, subsidies to the farmers, the same subsidies that America gave to their farmers, cheap loans to the farmers, the same cheap loans that the UK gave to their wood, pro wood producers, uh, protection of your borders, to, to, to protect your borders from importation. To give so you start with food? Food. Produce, livestock. produce food, subsidize food production so that food is cheap. Cheap. Export your surplus. Yes. And, but, but the World Trade Organization now frowns on things like uh, subsidies, they call it, uh, market access, domestic competitiveness, and all these funny, funny things that they talk about. So if, imagine if Ghana government started subsidizing the production of maize and, or rice. I'm sure a rice exporters from Vietnam will complain to WTO and say the Ghana government is, <laughs> is doing unfair trade rules, unfair trade practices. No, Bernard, I think we've got, we've got in the WTO wrong, honestly. Uh, Japan lives on rice. And he told the United States and the world, nobody's going to come here and sell us rice. If there's war, what do we do? We are not going to depend on anybody. Nigeria has banned about 160 items. So we use that as an excuse. And I'm not going to buy that. Now, the, the AU mm -hmm. can also organize itself. Now you have an African woman who is heading the WTO. So a development tool a, a, a fundamentally key development tool that was used by everybody to get to where they are. Now they are telling you that you can't use the same thing that I use, and now you are accepting that. Please, let's, let's begin to use our brains and think and be bold and see through mm. when we are being like Kwame Nkrumah new colonialism. So the point is here mm. that every country started with the same formula. Your natural resources, your land and your people. Mm -hmm. right? And you do learning by doing, learning by doing. You get better, you get better. You cannot allow somebody who has been doing it for 50 years, 60 years, has perfected the system to come open your doors, to come into your country and compete with you inside your country. It doesn't make sense. So you are telling me that my brother who started a company um, and making uh, what flour, let's say flour, we, we grow maize here. Eh? Now you open your borders. The United States be giving flour for how many years? The UK knows how to make flour. German make, China makes flour. They can come and sell their flour here in Ghana to compete with my brother who is doing it here, who started only two years ago. He has 10 employees. His prices will not be competitive. 
His, his, his quality will not be the same. His ca- packaging will be inferior. You understand what I'm saying? So there's, you're talking about import substitution type of production where the facts, the things that you can produce, you produce them here, you prevent importation as a starting point. Forgetting what anybody sells internationally. Oh, well, definitely. Why did China refuse to join the WTO? For many until, years. On, yes, for until 25 years ago. Because China was smart. China knew that right now I'm starting my industrialization. I have nothing to sell to anybody. My, my competitive strength is weak. Mm. My prices are high, so I'm not going to join. Mm. And if I don't join, nobody can come here. Mm-hmm. Let me focus myself and through learning by doing gradually, gradually, I'll get better. Mm-hmm. When I get better and I'm comfortable that I'm ready to compete, then I'll join. Mm. That's exactly what they did. And when they joined, their price were cheaper. White goods, refrigerators, dry machines, washes, America used to make them. The Chinese people took over the whole thing mm-hmm. and became rich. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Now, two years ago, when Donald Trump was retracting from free trade, Mm-hmm. and all of that. The president of China, Chairman Xi Jinping, the, the, the country that didn't want to join the, the, the WTO, who didn't want global competition, he is now waving the flag of free trade. Do you so understand? Basically, when people are in a bad situation, they distrust the system. So, so as soon as they start making it, then they said, let's, let's, let's of course. So Africa should do the same. Ghana should do the same. Well, I mean, we must look at why is Africa still poor? The, the point is this that you, you were colonized, you can have an excuse for that. But you have been independent. And you look at the global economic architecture, and you see that regardless of how high I try, eh, mm. I'm still at standstill. So common sense tells me that, why don't you digest and look at why are you at a standstill? Eh? So you start with your land and your people. Yes. You do agriculture production. At what point do you move into industrialization? At the point when you have overproduced. Mm. Because the initial production is to satisfy the domestic market. Okay. But now, let me also say this. An economy is nothing more than a system you create Mm. to produce goods and services initially for your own people. And as you produce it for your own people, because your own, your own market has certain strength. Mm-hmm. You are selling inside your market, and you are, you are getting better, and you are getting better. So that is the domestic economy. Before you even think of exports. Mm. So that's your domestic, based on the natural resources that you have, and what your people know how to do. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, at the point that you have produced more than what your people need, mm-hmm. then you start thinking of exports. Now, what form can I, can I export it? Should I export it in the raw form mm. or should I export it in a higher value form? So if I have cocoa, mm. should I just sell the beans? How much is the beans? Or should I learn how to make chocolate? And if, if I don't know how to make the chocolate, can I go to Switzerland in the U.S. and hire somebody, JV, to come here to make the chocolate here with my beans and I get more money? I get more money from the cocoa beans, then I can pay my cocoa uh, growers better income my economy will be stronger. Now, in our case, let me give you an example. The UK started with wool. They are shepherds. They are people who are rearing goats and cows and, and sheep. sheep. That's what they were doing in the 1400s under King, King Henry VII and King Henry VIII. Now, King Henry VII came up with the law. This is all we have, wool. From now on, nobody can export wool in its raw form. Similar to nobody, Process it here. Yes, similar to what we should have said. Nobody can export cocoa beans in its raw form, comparison. Now, we have to use the wool here to make textile. And they became the high-tech industry of the world, textiles. You understand? Even with this, they didn't have the scale. Eh? Flanders, the down country, had the scale for transforming wool into textile. He went down there and pushed their best workers and brought them. And gradually, the UK became the textile center of the world. Ghana could have become the chocolate center of the world. So now, but what I'm saying to my, my, my fellow citizens is this, that we have come to a point where we really need to do deep rethinking. Mm. Because the road we are traveling 
is different from the road that every nation traveled to get to where they are. We'll take a break. This is the point of view. My guest is Dr. Kofi Amwa, economist, industrialist, businessman, sports administrator. You can tell the economics part is strong. He's essentially saying we should pay workers better on May Day. And it's not just government. We should pay workers better. We should use our land and our people, develop agriculture and industrialize. But is that a full story? We'll be back with more. Stay with us. day to meet every challenge. It's a good day to want more out of life. It's a good day to wish for it, work for it, go get it. Familiar taste, a delicious indulgent with a flavor you just can't hide. Refreshing energy, gives so much for so little. For a strong performance, you've come to the right place. Good day energy drink. Why wait a minute to enjoy a good day when every second counts? Good Day Energy Drink keeps you going. Excessive drinking can be detrimental to your health. Not recommended for persons under 18 years, lactating mothers, pregnant women, and people sensitive to caffeine. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Welcome back to The Point of View. Today is the May Day edition. We salute all workers, Ghanaian workers or workers in Ghana. Keep up the good work. And as Dr. Kofi Amo is saying, we have to pay workers better. And that's the focus for the next year. But let's come back to what you said. So you said we should use land and our people, develop agriculture, stop exporting raw cocoa beans, build factories here, add value. So a great industrialization. Mm -hmm. When I speak to people in government... They tell me we don't have as much money because you need capital for investment. So, for example, if you want to set up a cocoa or chocolate processing factory, you don't have the money. So somebody from Switzerland can come up and do a JV. You don't have the risk. The, 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 sometimes you don't have the, the know-how, the links to the chocolate value chain. Mm -hmm. How do you address that issue of money? Because, yes, you have land, you have people, you have cocoa. But to build a factory to be competitive and compete against the Japanese and the Swiss, Swiss you need a lot of capital. Where are you going to get that from? Well, the man, Mao Chichun of China, borrowed throughout the development cycle of China, borrowed only $85 million from Japan, and later on he regretted it. I think that our view of this has taken ourselves out of the wealth inside Ghana. And that we think that uh, we, we now we have to define what money is. Okay? So, mm. so you, if, if we, we, you say we need money and all of that. Let me give you an example of, let's take cantonments. Mm -hmm. Laboni. Mm -hmm. You probably agree with me that 80% of the houses there are paid for. There's no debt. Right? A house serves two purposes. A roof over your head, and it's also an investment. Now, if a house in Laboni is valued at $500,000, and there's no debt, and you cannot take in any money from it, you have wealth eh? frozen in, in concrete. Mm. Not helping him, not helping the country. So you multiply that by all the houses in Accra. And you begin to see mm -hmm. the amount of value that we have frozen eh, in concrete. Now, when they were doing the banking reform, mm -hmm. they didn't even think about that. And to me, this is one area where going around looking for the gold that is already in your hand, the wealth that you're looking for to come and catalyze development inside your country, some of it is already. I'm not seeing all of it. I did a back of the envelope analysis. We are 30 million people. Let's say you have 10 people on the average living in one house. So 30 million people will give you what? 3 million dwellings. 
Let's say the three million dwellings, I give you the value, average value of fifty thousand dollars. Three million times fifty is one fifty billion US dollars of the houses in Ghana if we were to value them. Assuming that we even take only twenty percent of it. Twenty percent of one fifty billion is what? Thirty billion. That can be released. Right now, Ghana owes forty billion dollars that we are paying interest that, like you said earlier on, when all the revenue of government come together, it can only service the debt of public sector employees and the principal and interest payment on the debt. We are at a standstill. So we need to start thinking outside the box to understand capitalism. So capital is bigger than money. And you're saying that in real estate in Ghana, we have hidden trapped capital. This is Hernando de Soto stuff. Thank you. And you're basically saying, so what, what's the problem? Is that we don't understand economics or what? Well, or, I mean, or our, we are, because a lot of the countries have developed. Yes. Somebody has a house in cantonment, mm -hmm. as you said, $500,000. Mm -hmm. He can use that as collateral to go for a loan, to go and start a new company in another Thank country. You. So you are, you are basically saying that we can't say we don't have money because money is not cash. We are talking about capital. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the properties we have, we can convert it to capital. You can release money for productive activities. Wow. If there were mortgage banks mm. and I have a house, 500,000, and I go and say, give me 20%, that is a, a safe risk for any bank. Okay? He gives me $100,000 to invest. And I'll use that money wisely because if I don't, I'll lose my house. My house is the so we need a system of capital formation. A, a system of, we need a banking sector that understands securitizing of real estate. The 2008 global came from the United States. In the U.S., the, the banks give loans to all these houses, and they put them together. It can come to like one trillion dollars. All the loans, then some insurance company will buy some. And there are some pension funds in Norway that will buy some that will, So it becomes a global asset. But the money has been released for, for real estate companies to build the houses, mm. for, for individuals to occupy the houses and buy them and pay monthly mm. towards it. Now, when that happens, the house needs a carpet. It needs a refrigerator. Okay? It need, it need, it, there's a demand pool of the economy. Anytime you build one house, you are creating a demand for a lot of things that go into the house. And that's how you, you, you create growth in an economy. So in Ghana, the real estate industry sector being dormant is affecting us. So we can convert our real estate into capital if we properly give it title. Then that becomes a securitization for loans. Exactly. Wow. So, is that why you said that? Ghana should not borrow because I heard you say no. that we don't need Ghana beyond aid, but we need Ghana beyond debt. Yes. What, what did you mean by that? As for borrowing, Bernard, if you can get debt, it's a plus. Mm. What that means is that somebody is willing to give you money mm -hmm. for you to invest the money and come and pay them back. And therefore, you, what you have to do is to use the borrowed money wisely. Mm. In an individual or a private company's issue, it becomes a simple thing. Mm. I know exactly what I'm going to use the money for within my company or the investment I'm going to do, to, and I know how the return is going to come. And with that return, I can pay the interest and the principal and keep the balance. Mm. Mm. In the case of a nation, if you go and borrow $1 billion to do a flyover, in my estimation, the flyover is important, but the more important thing of the $1 billion is the multiplier effect within your economy. Mm -hmm. So, how do you get multiplier effect? Multiplier effect comes in when the $1 billion, $1 billion lands in Ghana and the contractor for the project is a Ghanaian company. He's hiring Ghanaians. He's buying the materials for doing the project within Ghana. He's buying the cement here. The iron rods, he's buying them here. And I'm assuming that at some point we are making the iron rods here. We are making the cement here. A lot of workers have been hired. They have money in their pocket. Now they are buying more bread. 
The bread maker now has to make more bread. He needs more flour. So he's buying more flour. The flour is used by, by maize growers. Now, the corn and maize growers are growing more corn. You are now totally transforming your economy. Using the same one this billion. The same one billion. The same one billion, the multiplier effect in the place like that is about four. The same one billion becomes four billion. But in a situation where when you took the loan, you gave the contract to a Brazilian company, Queros Gavao, to come and build the, that, the one that we just did. He is bringing his Brazilian consultants. A lot of the, I saw that, a lot of the inputs he's going to do are already prefab, ship them in and come and assemble them. The multiplier effect of that loan is z- zero to them. Now, when they finish, obviously, the flyover will be of use because maybe traffic congestion is now eased. So cars will fly over it, but you are left with a concrete structure with a dead hang, a loan of one billion. How are you going to pay it? When you didn't create a multiply effect within your economy to create more revenue, you didn't create more workers who will now become taxpayers. If you created more workers who are now taxpayers, the tax revenue can go to retarded debt. In other words, the debt can become a positive attitude, additive to your GDP. So your challenge is what we spend the money on. How you spend the money. How we spend the it money. in a way that brings a multiplier effect. To your but economy. you notice a lot of our money we borrow is used to retire old debt. So that's mm-hmm. even so that a, even, a, large, even worse. a large chunk of your debt is even just going to pay old that's debt. That's what I call Ponzi scheme. So the economy is like a Ponzi scheme. It is a Ponzi scheme. Borrowing to pay debtors. Yes. And you are standing still. Wow. At some point, at some point, because your economy is growing, nobody will, will lend to you. And the debt will be called. I'm not too sure how we have collateralized our debt. I'm not too sure what assets we have used to wow. collateralize our debt. Then called. it looks very bleak. It is very bad. And this is why. And I'm not uh, pointing this to, 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 to try to uh, uh, damage any government or anything like that. This is something that has been going on. But it got it to a point that we need to stop it. That's why I have this petition going. I have a petition, and I hope you, to, for people to sign, to signal to the, to the bond dealers in Europe and the international financial institutions that stop giving loans. They should stop giving loans to Africa or to Ghana. To Ghana, for now. They should um, stop giving loans to Ghana. For now. We must learn how to use the loans properly first. Really? That's what the, uh, the Kenyans are telling the IMF. Kenya went and borrowed 2.5 billion, and they, then they, they had about 500,000 signatures. So you're saying we should? Are you talking about all types of loans or the bond market? Well, because they do the road shows and they borrow from the bond market. This is different from the non-concessionary loans they get from the World Bank and those type of things. So which type of borrowing are you saying? A loan stop? is a loan. Any loan that is that is not a grant. Any loan that you have to pay f- back with the principal and the interest. We must learn how to use loans. Look, we owe $40 billion. A multiplier effect of four means that that money should be $160 billion. Does our economy look like $160 billion are passed through here? Thank you. I've made my point. So what is the point in the borrowing? So which aspect of Ghana's economy are you positive about? Are you because it's like the we are not producing enough, we are not paying people well enough, we are boring and spending on the wrong things. It looks very bleak. It is bleak. Now there are some light, little lights at the little tunnels we have in in food through the planting for food and jobs. We exported some food to Bukina, Bukina Faso and to Ivory Coast. It's not bad, but in my estimation, it's not enough. It's not massive enough. It is not transformative, like cocoa, where you're getting billions. And you have the cocoa industry created small, small uh, uh, companies, the family f- farms and mm. all of that, that they can, pay, they can pay their children's school fees and all of that. Now, if we're going to do planting for food and jobs, when I went to China, you are driving out of Beijing, and then all of a sudden, but now you come to a place where there are houses built, there's nobody there. They plan before they move the people in there. So if you're going to do planting for food and jobs, like the, using the people and the land we have as an economic development model, I would think that we are going to tell maybe what, 
10,000 hectares that they will be housing situation there so the workers will be living there. There will be clinics for the workers when they get sick. There will be schools there for the children of the workers. So it is, a, it is an approach of the realization that I have a certain asset, mm. land and people, that I'm now going to massively use to produce something for domestic consumption and for export, and also to fill my factories. Now, if you have a factory, we are talking about graduate unemployment. When you build a factory, you will begin to see that there is a chain of need for all kinds of scales. Now, if we are producing something for export, eh, you will do, you do labeling. Someone who stud studied graphic arts at King USD can be employed there. Commercial lawyers will write your, 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 your agreements for you. Transportation, there will be a whole network of moving the goods and services, forklift operators. Eh? You have biochemists, if it is a, a food product, who are measuring the, the, the pH level of the... I worked in a, in a, in a, in a factory like that, and my job was to assess the pH level of the, the cans and mm. all of that. So the way that we create an economy is to think through the assets that you have with which you're going to use the economic development. And when you calculate that properly, then you're going to see the creation of a chain of jobs and opportunities that bring you your young people, those who are, who are educated and those who are not so educated. And that's how we should What do you think forward. about the graduates we produce? There's a lot of conversation about that, that they are not trained in the skills that are required for the modern world. You are an entrepreneur yourself, and therefore they need a nice balance of being administratively skilled but also entrepreneurial. And I know you go to university to, to talk and things like this. Mm -hmm. What is your... What is your verdict on Ghana's tertiary graduates and what can be done for them? I'll answer the question, but Bernard, I think my difficulty with those kind of questions is that because we didn't start properly, you know, like you and I were talking about uh, using your land and people resources to catalyze the development of a strong domestic economy. Mm. If you don't do that, everything you do later on it's like building sandcastles, mm. you know. So you are producing by chemists at KNUSD. What are they coming to do? Huh? You are producing uh, mechanical engineers. But when you are building a road, you are giving the contract to the Chinese. They are bringing their, their bridge engineers. You see my point? So I'm, I'm almost at a point where I, 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 I want to call for a restart of building a strong domestic Ghanaian economy, realizing the assets God gave us that we have to do this building with. The vast land you're talking about and all our sisters and brothers who may not be educated, but they are not stupid. They are intelligent human beings. Now, when Korea, Taiwan, and these people started, they were 75 to 80% illiterate. Mm -hmm. Use the people the way you have them build wealth, and then deploy the wealth into superior education. Now you can pay the teachers well so they are focused. You can have classrooms built already. You can give them computers. So you are doing education. That makes sense. The desire to do something is not enough. You must have capacity. And the way you have capacity is by building, starting to build a strong domestic economy that produces majority of the things you need on Obviously, we have to trade with somebody. I'm not saying otaki, don't trade with anybody. But we must be able to maximize mm. the production of the things that we have natural advantages. Five degrees above the equator, the re Greenwich Meridian passing through Ghana, the rainfall, the sunshine, the central region of Ghana, a lot of studies have been done. The soil and climatic conditions are superior and better than that in Brazil. But the yield of maize in Brazil is 14 times the yield in central region of Ghana. Do you understand? So you have been given this enormous asset that you didn't pay anything for. And we are importing flour. We, we cereals and other things, we, we, we import 789 million a year. Eh? Wow. Cereals. That's the, what I had the, the, the exercise. I was going to read them to you. 
you, you, you're going to ask me, how do we create jobs for our people? There are things we are doing that doesn't make sense. Important things that we have the natural advantage to do it better than the people we are buying from. They say the importers support political parties. So the parties, when they come to power, don't want to stop, spoil their business. That's what we are told. You see, we, 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 it looks like we've turned everything into a joke. And, um, you know... <laughs> That's the truth. Yes, I mean, you know. But, but it could be true that somebody has a corner on importing flour. And he's a contributor to a political but party. But that's, that's actually true. Yeah. So how do you go into politics to run your nation and, and, and believe in these things? So uh, I, the, the movement for progress that we formed for young people is to wake young people up. I'm 72 years old. I don't know how many more years I have. But you have more at stake in the future of Ghana than I do. And therefore, these things that are happening, we should not accept them. We'll take a break and come and talk about a movement for progress. <laughs> this is the point of view. We're talking to Dr. Kofi Amwa. Lots of strong economic ideas on May Day, workers, the economy, debt, productivity, all coming up. Uh, we'll be right back. Stay with us. Available in major supermarkets and shops near you. Excessive drinking can be detrimental to your health. Not recommended for persons under 18 years, lactating mothers, pregnant women, and people sensitive to caffeine. This advert is FDA approved. Welcome back. This is The Point of View. My guest is Dr. Kofi Amoa. He is a, an economist and a businessman and a sports administrator. We'll talk about sports briefly, though. But you formed a movement for, uh, what is it called? A move, move, for, for pro, is it a political party? No, it's not a political party, but it's politically aware. In the sense that you have enormous joblessness of the youth in mm. Ghana. Mm. It's about 40 to 55 percent. It's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And if you have a society where your most important asset for your present circumstances and for your future livelihood as a nation is invested in the youth and the youth are working around aimlessly, it is not a, pres a prescription for any country. So me and a group of people talked and talked and said, let's find a way to, to organize the people. We have about 500,000 members. You have 500,000 oh, yeah, members? Yeah, 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 yeah. People are angry. Members? I got, I got, I got sick, and therefore, it, you know, I got, I've said it before, I, I wow. got sick. So I was out for about two months. So there, there's, there's, and I'm on Twitter. I know you are on Twitter too. So there's a lot of interaction and a lot of anger and frustration in the youth, don't know what to do, can't find a job, eh? wow. looking for help. Half a million young people are on this. And, and what, what, we, what, what, we, what, what do they do? We, just discuss we, ideas? Or no, do they, they, want are, to, they are members now. now or they want, to, they want to come to power? They want to, no, to, no, to they, they, it's a run for office? It's a, it's a platform. Mm -hmm. It's a platform for exchanging ideas and also creating a community that at some point will agitate for something good to happen for them. I see. Some people think sports could be one of the ways in which we could give youth employment and move them out of poverty. You, you led our CAN 2008 efforts. That's 13, some 14 years ago now. Have you, what, what, what do you make of Ghana sports generally? And then the nation's passion football in particular. Has it brought the fruits that you thought it, it would bring? 
Well, I mean, I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm negative on everything, but uh, I'm not happy because football is big business. You take Spain, the football economy is 2% of their GDP. That translates to 75 to $105 billion, the football economy alone. The UK, higher. And therefore, it's not just kicking the ball, you know. You have a passion for something. And this something, Ghana has been playing football for over 100 years. Okay? Mm. There are countries who just came in and are doing much better. So for me, it has potential. But Bernard, anything that has potential must also be approached the right way. Football is about the player. That's the centerpiece of sports. And therefore, the player must be, the player welfare must be important, must be paid well. You see that a lot of my brothers and sisters who are into football, they are trying. They've invested their money and all of that. But it's almost like if it takes 10,000 CDs to do something and you only have 1,000, don't go and start with the 1,000. You will lose the money. And that's what's happening. We've not made the right adequate investment in our football because we can't pay the players well. So a good player's dream is to go outside. The pitches are not the best. Training facilities are not the best. Eh? So the Black Stars, you look at them. When we invite the camp for the Black Stars, most of them are outside. Yeah, they started from Ghana, but they have been finished up by somebody else's training. And they come here, I hear that now they're asking for $25 million to go for the AFCON and for the World Cup. Is that the right approach? No, it's not. The right approach is to strengthen, is that like the economics we are talking about? Strengthen your local football league. Mm. Starting from juvenile football, mm -hmm. Sami Kofu, ACN, and all of these people. This is where they got their strength. Okay? When the Germans saw that our football is going as cans, they said, time out. We need to rethink. We need to replan. It took them 11 years, but they went to Brazil and won the World Cup. Ghana can win the World Cup. We have the talent. But the organization of the approach mm. is the wrong one. And I hope that, uh, I hope my friends at the GFA are not going to be angry with me. They know my position. Uh, we, we, did, we restructured the statutes of the GFA they got a good body of laws uh, with FIFA approving it. And, and if the guidelines are followed and the efforts are made to attract the right level of investment into football, then Ghana football can rise again. Is football still the golden egg? The hand that is the golden egg? Because, they have some, for example, we have the Olympics coming. Our men's relay team have qualified. There, there appears to be a lot of money in football. Some people think that it's not really the best. We have athletic talents. We have boxing. What's your view? Well, football dwarfs every sport in the world. It's not just in Ghana. You know, the FIFA, when the World Cup is being played, the whole world is looking at it. FIFA is making billions of dollars. It's a competition among nations. You look at the Premier League. Now you saw that the, the only Super form, League, yeah, the Super League, which you know is not going to work. So football is a bigger brand, and I think even in Ghana, football has been a bigger sports brand from Kwame Nkrumah's time or Hinijan to today. So we must still protect the football, but I think we must invest in other areas as well. Mm. These athletics boys you're talking about, they did well. I hear they've been disqualified. They, no, yeah, they, yeah, but they still made the time. Okay. So even though they, they, they dropped the baton for the final, the time they did in the, the heat was good enough to qualify them for the Olympics. Oh, thank God for that. Yeah. Because you see that they are very spirited and, uh, and all that. So a little bit of effort in, in those areas, I think, can also give Ghana some medals and give us. What do you think about the taxes, though? We are, we are, today is uh, May 3. And from 1st May, new fuel prices kicked in. A lot of the, the new taxes that the budget announced kicked in this week. And there's a lot of conversation on Twitter on that. There's even a hashtag on, on fix the country and that type of thing. How does government balance looking for revenue with also being sensitive to, to the Ghanaian citizens' economic situation? Look, here again... You have sectors in every economy. You have the public sector and you have the private sector. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Most individuals fall into the private sector domain. 
-hmm. So taxation is taking money from the private sector in individual pockets to the public sector. And if the public sector is managing the public finances well, that we've been talking about, the borrowing, the taxation, the grants all together is being managed well, then it will help the economy to move forward. But if it's not helping, and taking more money, keep taking more money from the efficient seg segment of the economy into the inefficient segment. The public sector is where you have corruption, is where you have malfeasance, you have, you have, you have all kinds of tenders making things not go well. This is not for any particular government. This is like that in every society. The public sector is not the efficient se sector. But Ghana is in debt, and we have to pay the debt. And therefore, as a government, they don't have any other way to go unless our oil revenue, somehow something changes and we find more oil or the price of oil goes up or some miracle happens. They have to come back to the citizens of the country to go and pay the debt. And this is why I'm telling Ghanaians, you must signal your dissatisfaction to the government that the borrowing should stop. Because if you sit there unconcerned and the borrowing keeps going on, the taxation will come back to you because they have to pay that debt. And if that debt is not being used properly to create movement in the economy, to mm. create more jobs, eh? to, to make Ghanaian's company become more profitable, to make Ghanaian workers get more bigger wages and salaries, mm. eh? because things are being done well, then the borrowing can be positive. But if that's not happening, the borrowing is negative. And you must signal that it should stop. So you, this petition, where is it? Is it online or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got How many signatures? Change.org change slash stop borrowing now. <laughs> <laughs> Change.org <laughs> slash stop borrowing now. How many signatures do you have? Uh, How right. many are you hoping to get? Well, I was hoping Kenya got close to 500,000 in about a couple of weeks. See, this is the dormant Ghanaian citizenry. Where things are happening. And I haven't now. heard of it. I didn't know there was a campaign. Okay, so now you better go and sign, please. Change.org slash stop borrowing now. And you are sending it to who? We are signaling to all the bond traders who are giving euro bonds loans to Ghana. That they should stop. They should stop. Then you are going to destroy this year's budget because if you read the budget, there's already a planned round of euro bonds. They've already started doing the marketing. Mm -hmm. So you're basically asking, you are, you are putting a spanner in the works of Kenoforiata. A lot of Ghanaian, Ghanaian, I mean, a lot of African countries have started doing the same thing I'm doing because it is not working. Wow. Their politicians go and borrow, and the citizens are not seeing the benefit of the borrowing. They must speak up. African citizens must speak up. We need a new formula. We were colonized for, for, for a century in Ghana for 113 years. We became independent. Mm. The black man can take care of his own affairs. We are in control of our land and our people and our resources. We must use them properly okay. to benefit the people. Well, fantastic stuff. Thank you very much, Dr. Kofi Amwa. Always a pleasure talking to you. Very uh, interesting ideas on the economy, development, certainly on wages, and of course on sports development as well. It's been a great time. Thank you. Thank you. And we wish you a happy May Day rest. Thank you for watching. My name is Bernard Avle. We'll be with you next time. Stay with City TV. Bye-bye. Point of View is sponsored by First National Bank. First National Bank, how can we help you? The Point of View is brought to you by Cowbell Coffee. Cowbell Coffee, taste it, love it.